The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Now I should like to introduce a representative of our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Your future is his business. Security in years to come for you, your home, and your family. Yes, your future is in good hands when you entrust your life insurance program to a representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll take only a few seconds because I have a very simple request. In about 14 minutes, Mr. Keating is going to tell you about the Equitable Society's famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. I know from personal experience that this chart can make an enormous difference in your family's future. So, please listen carefully when Mr. Keating gives the surprising details on the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers, prepared by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Big Case Out. In addition to bringing you the people up to date on the latest trends in crime, the Federal Bureau of Investigation cooperates in presenting this program because it hopes that through this medium it will be able to clear up some of the misconceptions the public has about crime and criminals. One of those mistaken ideas, perhaps the one which annually costs the American people the most money, was recently graphically illustrated by a national magazine. The editor took pictures of 20 of the most dangerous inmates of Alcatraz. He mixed them with 20 pictures of men out of who's who, men whose accomplishments have made them the leaders of the nation. Readers were asked to check which men were the criminals, or asked to try to separate the decent from the lawbreakers. Their failure to identify the criminals was amazing to the editors, but not to the members of your FBI who know that it is impossible to tell which person is a criminal from the way he dresses, walks, talks, or looks. Your FBI does not suggest that you regard every stranger as a criminal, but it does say that you are deluding yourself if you pose as an infallible judge of character and use only the things you see to make a decision. Criminals can be and are tall, short, fat, lean, well-dressed, or slovenly. In fact, they answer any and every description you can name because they possess no common physical ailment, unless it be short-sightedness. By now, it should be common knowledge that anyone who decides to be a criminal is short-sighted indeed. Tonight's file opens at a Midwestern county fair. It is late afternoon, and on the half-mile track beside the midway, trotting horses are warming up for the seventh race. A young woman sits in the grandstand watching as the man approaches. Nancy. Where you been? Just about every place in the fairgrounds. Come on, let's get out of here. But I got a bet in this race. I got $10 on number five. You got a loser. How do you know? I passed through the paddock when they hooked up those things to the horses. Well? Every one of the drivers are old, but you're a man. They had to lift him to get him in. Come on. Oh, please, Gene, I want to see it. It'll only take a minute. They're all in line, ready for the start. See, they're starting right now. Well, okay. Here they come. And they're off. Hey, oh, oh, hey, oh, 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 the start, oh, that's Fulham oh, McCracken oh, first. Oh, Harry Volo second. Oh, and Alan Axworthy third. Hey, oh, Which one is yours? Number five, Jim's boy. The one the man in green is driving. Come Pretty on. far back. On, He's moving up, Gene, look. Honey, I should be sending some wires right now. What? I've got to tell Brewer and Hudson to meet Down the back stretch, it's Perry Volo by three lengths. Fulton McCracken second by two. And Jim's boy is third. A half third. length in front Jim's of Alan Axel. Come on, Jim's boy. Come on. And that's Jim's boy now in the break. What? He's broken his stride. He won't win now. Let's go, Nancy. Oh, but Gene, my ten dollars. Honey, we'll get it back tomorrow with interest when we stick up this joint. Come on, 
The next morning, Special Agent Jim Taylor is standing in front of the city jail when a car approaches. A car driven by Agent Ken Wakefield. Jim, oh, Jim. Oh, hi, Ken. Want a lift? Sure. Where are you going? U.S. Attorney's Office. Okay. What's doing at the jail? Well, we're one down and three to go on the Spencer mob. Who? The Spencer mob. They're the ones that... Hey, that's right. You weren't in the office when that came in, were you? I don't think so. Our bank messenger was held up and brutally beaten back east three months ago. Huh? After the doctors pieced him together, he identified all four of the bandits. Uh-huh. The head man is Gene Spencer. Long record. He's been charged with everything up to and including murder. And he's around loose? Well, the jury said the murder was self-defense. Oh, one of those. Yeah. Two other times, he had an airtight alibi. Once, a witness who could have convicted him disappeared. Sounds pretty sharp. Oh, he is. And his wife is just as rough a customer. She's a fainter. A uh, what? A fainter. She can haul off and faint on order. Ah. Oh. The third one is a Louis Hudson, also a long record. And the fourth man was Charlie Brewer, alias the farmer. You say was? I just finished interviewing him. He was picked up by the police early this morning. Alone? Yeah, but he had a wire from Spencer in his pocket. It said, have job. We'll call you at midnight. Midnight tonight? No, last night. A strip of paper with a date line was missing, but there was a time stamp on the wire with yesterday's date. Too bad you don't oh, know... Ken, green light. Oh, yeah. Too bad you don't know where the wire was from, Jim. Well, that's why I'm going over to the U.S. Attorney's office now, Ken. I want a search warrant for the farmer's hotel room. He lives here in town? Yes, the police found a hotel key in his pocket. He's at the Hotel Central. As soon as I get the warrant, I'm going over there. <laughs> Yeah? It's me, Louie. Oh, come on in. I can't. My car is surrounded by pigs. Just walk through them. But I don't want to get bit or stung, whatever it is they do to you. Come on. They won't hurt you. Well, okay. All right, come on. Get away from me, will you, pig? My blow, pig. Get away. Hey, what kind of deal is this, Gene? Come on in. I'll tell you all about it. Nancy. Yeah? Louie's here. Make us some coffee, will you? Okay. Gee, tell me, what's with the pigs? We're gonna use them. In the heist? Yeah. Calm me out. Why? I don't work with no animals. I did a job once in Brooklyn. I used the dog, I got bit. From then on, I work with people. You don't have to go near the pigs. Oh, it's a job. Did you see the fairgrounds outside of town? Yeah, yeah, I saw. And this is a map of the whole place. You're gonna heist the fairgrounds? You'll get six lemon pies. Just listen. You see this thing? That's the midway. Uh-huh. This place is a half-mile track. Harness races. Yeah. I've seen them once. They're nothing. On this road here, this is the back of the racetrack. There's a gate at this end, one over here. Uh-huh. This building on the back road is the secretary's office. They bring the dough there right after the last race. How much? About 60 Gs. One guy brings it. And what do the pigs do? Take it away from them? No. This is the layout. Eleven minutes after the last race... Nancy faints in front of this place here, the first aid tent. Mm-hmm. I'm with her. The guy starts to take care of her. I whack him out, and we grab the ambulance. Oh. They uh, got an ambulance all the time? Yeah, for the racetrack guys. While we're doing that, you keep the back gate open and clear. How? I stole a fairground cop's uniform. You wear that. Okay. So far, we got an ambulance and a cop's uniform. Oh, uh, the farmer's in this thing, too. Oh, where is he? He'll be here. Now, as we grab the ambulance, the farmer drives up to the front gate. He's got a truck with the pigs in it. He parks it so he blocks the gate and blows. Yeah, but what about the pigs? He takes them along. He goes to the secretary's office. He gets there as the guy with the dough comes in. The farmer lets go of the pigs. There's a commotion. He grabs the dough, and we pick him up in the ambulance. We go for the back gate. We get you. We're gone. Oh. Wait a my word. If it'll work, take my word for it. When you figure on doing it? Tomorrow.
Special Agent Wakefield speaking. Jim Taylor, Ken. Oh, yes, Jim. I just finished searching the farmer's room. Find anything? No, and I called Western Union. They couldn't trace that wire that he got from Spencer. That's too bad. There's just one alley open, Ken. When he called the farmer here last night, the call must have gone through long distance. Uh Uh-huh. The operator here at the hotel who took the call is off duty now, but the manager's trying to locate it for me. That'll be a help. Oh, Ken, uh, will you check this license number for me? Sure. California 51X739. California 51X739. That's it. Now, whose car is it? It's the farmer's. I found it in the hotel garage. He was... Oh, pardon me, Ken. Sure. Yes, sir? Have yeah. Yes, it might be. Yes, thanks very much. Oh, Ken. Yes? That car you had this morning, will you get it out of the garage again? Where are we going? The manager just located the operator who took that call from Spencer. He called from Aurora. Now, from the background noises the operator heard as he was dropping the coins in, he was probably calling from the fairgrounds. Uh, you'd, uh, you'd better alert the authorities in Aurora. Right. Then pick me up in front of the hotel. We'll get down there ourselves. Hey, Nancy. Where's Jean? He's over by the gate waiting for the farmer. Didn't he show yet? No. No. How's the uniform look, huh? A little on the Keystone side. I bet you'd help. Louie. Oh, yeah, yeah, Jim. It don't look like the farmer's going to show. Oh, fine. Oh, great. Does that mean the job is off? No, we do it anyway. How? You're going to be the farmer. Oh, no. No. I ain't fooling with no pigs. Louie, I've already told you, those pigs wouldn't hurt anybody. Yeah, but how could I be a farmer? Look at this kisser, will you? You ever see a farmer that looked like me? Louie, we put in too much time on the build-up for this job. You've got to do it. What about this uniform? Take it off. Put on your own suit. You want a suit, Farmer? There's a straw hat in the truck. Wear that. Gene, we only got ten minutes. Okay. Now, let's run over your new deal, Louie. In five minutes, you drive the truck over there and park it so that it blocks the front gate. You got it? Yeah, mm-hmm. I think so. You think so? Well, let's make sure. In five minutes, I drive the truck over there. And park it so it blocks that front gate. I know, I know. Then you take the pigs and get over to the secretary's office. I suppose the guy with the door is late. Stall inside the office. But how? Register the pigs for the show. Okay. But don't go into the office until you see Nancy faint. I got it, I got it. Okay, start moving. I guess you can park here, Jim. Yeah. Ah, we missed the last race, Ken. Yeah, Spencer might still be around. No, I'll slide out your way. All right. Well, let's check at the secretary's office first, huh? Right. Is he the one that you spoke... Hey, wait a minute. Hold it, Ken. What? Look over there, by the front gate. Huh? See that man who just got out of the truck? The one in the straw hat? Yeah. Uh It looks like Louis Hudson. That is Hudson. What's he made up for with that hat and the pigs? I don't know. Let's wait around and find out. Okay. Hey, Ken. Ken, I think I know why he's in that getup. A farmer was arrested. Hudson's taking his place. They must be in action. Sure. He's headed this way. Yep. Probably for the secretary's office. Okay, okay, pigs. Stay in line, will you? Stay behind me. Take it easy. Pigs, stay right... Uh, Hudson? Huh? That's quite an outfit you've got on. Who are you? Special agent of the FBI. So? So where are your friends? I don't know who you're talking about, mister. I come here with these pigs, and they ain't hot. No, but you are. You and both the Spencers. Now, come on, where are they? Well, you're so smart, find out yourself. Oh, Jim, the Spencers! Jim, the Spencers were in there. Yeah, I know, Ken. Take Hudson here, then send out an alarm. I'm going to follow that ambulance. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now a quick interview with a man who's got a smile that's about a yard wide on his face. 
A man who's going to tell us how he got rid of a ten-year worry in less than ten minutes. That's a fact, Mr. Keating. Less than ten minutes after my Equitable Society representative handed me the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers, I knew I had that ten-year worry licked. Frank, why not tell us what that worry was? And how the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers helped you solve it. I guess the worry is one that's pretty familiar with most fathers. I'd say to myself, if I should die before my time, what's going to happen to my wife and kids? What income will they need to live the way I want them to? Now, I never realized it until my equitable man brought me that fact-finding chart. But this question of the monthly income that my family would need is basic. It's the heart of the whole matter. You're right there, Frank. Not one man in 50 really knows how much money his family would need to carry on without him and what they would require to maintain a decent standard of living until the children finish high school. The equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers gives you a sound and reliable basis on which to figure up the minimum expense. What's more, it's simplicity itself. Every step is made absolutely clear by easy-to-understand pictures. My wife and I actually got a real kick out of filling it in. After we'd finished, I turned to Betty and said, You know, dear, I guess we didn't have as much to worry about as I thought. That's the way it often is. Get the facts, and the solution of the problem turns out to be much easier than you expected. Well, that's what happened to me with a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Incidentally, Frank, how much did you pay for that chart? The equitable man didn't ask me for a cent. Of course not. This chart is absolutely free, and there's no obligation. Just drop a hint to any representative of the Equitable Society, and he'll be glad to see that you get a copy. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's spelled E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Big Case Out. For those who listen regularly to this official program from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who hear that in the past year more major crimes were committed than in any previous year in our history, they hear that and wonder why. There is the feeling among some that it is a sure sign of decadence and that it forecasts our inevitable doom as a nation. There are others who feel that the crime wave is due to improper policing. Now comes one sociologist who contends that much crime in America may be due to overemphasis or the lack of financial class barriers in this country. Naturally, we Americans are proud that no walls prevent a man from being poverty-stricken one day and a millionaire the next. In this nation, people have every opportunity to move from the have-nots to the haves. It can be and is being done legitimately every day in the week. But for those without the will to work, or the will to wait. This very emphasis sometimes makes the prospect of getting rich quickly through crime an irresistible temptation. A temptation that leads them through the whole labyrinth of crime, up to and including murder. That is all the more reason why you, the ambitious but honest American, must cooperate with your law enforcement officials to curb not your equally honest and ambitious competitors, but the dishonest, get-rich-quick operator who is the enemy of everything American. Night's file continues in a small room at the Aurora Fairgrounds. Special Agent Wakefield has just been called to the telephone. Wakefield speaking. Jim Taylor, Ken. Oh, any luck, Jim? No, the Spencers had too good a lead. I sent out the alarm, but they must be sticking to the back road. How about Louis Hudson? He's locked up tight. Good. Did you talk to him? I tried to, but I did all the talking. Oh. We have no lead on where the Spencers are heading. No. I went through Hudson's pockets, but all he had beside a gun was a $20 bill and his railroad ticket stub. Uh, oh, did you send out that alarm? Yes. Ken, I think the Spencers are too smart to stay with that ambulance. You better call the state police back. Okay. Have them check every out-of-the-way place on the theory that the ambulance will be abandoned. Right. And uh, you stay where you are. I'll meet you back at the fairgrounds. <laughs> Okay. Not yet. Well, nobody behind us. We're not safe till we get a new car. Where? Any place we can steal one. Well, if we get near a town. Yeah. Gee, look out! Well, hang on! Oh. 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 
Nancy. Yeah. Yeah. You okay? I don't know. Here. Grab my hand. Okay. I'm... Oh, steady. You'll be all right. The cops. Come on. I'll try to run. No. No, we stay here. Jump into this ditch. Come on, jump. He's not a cop. He must be. No uniform. He must be a sheriff. I can't see him. What's he doing? Walking to the ambulance. Oh. Get ready to go. Which way? Out of the road. You see it. Not after I fire this gun. <laughs> on the Spencers, Ken? Oh, yes, Jim. That's bad news. Why? What happened? They cracked up in the ambulance at Route 61. Yes? One of the county sheriffs came to the scene of the accident. He got out to give first aid. Huh? Spencer shot him and got away in the sheriff's car. Ouch. I sounded an alarm on the car as soon as he called in. Oh, good. I also had roadblocks set up on every one of the four highways he might have gotten to after he abandoned the ambulance. Oh, that's well, Ken. Uh, here. Look at the map, Jim. Yeah. The blocks are set up here on Route 61. Yeah. Here... Here and here. And then there are two down here. Yeah. And one over here. Mm-hmm. And we've got them contained in this circle here, huh? That's right. Yeah. Well, we still might not get them. Why not? Well, they might have a hideout inside this circle. The local police in each township are making a house-to-house search. Oh, good. In addition, there are six radio cars out cruising near the roadblocks in case Spencer tries to break through. Yeah. Ken, is there an extra radio car available? Yes, Jim. Fine, you take it and I'll use our car. Come on. We might make it now, Nancy. You think they stopped looking for it? No, but they won't do so good in the dark. Where are we? Still on Route 111. Hey. What? I just thought of this. This guy's radio must be tuned in to get police calls. So? So we can find out if they're still looking for us. Car 83. There he is. Car 83. Yes, Jim. Come in. Ken, my radio is on for a few minutes. Any word yet? Just finished talking to all the roadblocks. No sign of the sheriff's car yet. They know about this car. I'll check back with you later, Ken. They've got roadblocks. What do we do? Look in the glove compartment. Okay. What do you want? See if there's a map. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, here's one. Good. What are you slowing down for? I want to stop and look at the map. Let me have it. What good will it do? They're going to be talking to each other again on that radio. Probably be talking to the roadblocks, too. Yeah. We can check off every road that's blocked, can't we? Mm-hmm. And if there's one that's not covered, that's the one we take. Don't you see? Those cops can lead us right out of this trap. <laughs> Lock number six. There you are again. Lock number six. Come in, please. No sign of the car at this block. Thank you. Car 83. Car 83. Did you hear that? Yes, Jim. I think that means the Spencers have hauled up someplace. <laughs> we'll make another that. check of all roadblocks and all cars in 15 minutes. Right, Jim. Unless I hear from you, I'll just keep cruising. Okay. Does that mean they already checked everybody? Yeah. They didn't say anything about Route 111. That's why we're staying on. Gene, we're going to make it. Sure, I told you those suckers would lead us out. Oh, What's the matter? I just passed a sign, detour. You think it's a phony? Wait till I turn on the spotlight. No, it's all dug up, see? Uh-huh. What do we do now? Turn around, head the other way. Watch that side back there. Okay. We'll still make it, honey. How you want, Spencer? Huh? <gasps> Come on out of there, both of you. Come on. Copper, huh? Special agent of the FBI. FBI? Thanks for listening to the short wave that led you right to us. Gene Spencer, his wife Nancy, and Louis Hudson were tried and convicted in federal court. 
Each was given a 20-year sentence for bank robbery. When Special Agent Taylor learned that the deputy sheriff's car was equipped with two-way radio tuned to the same wavelength he was using, he decided it would be quicker to have the Spencers come to him. He therefore broadcast the list of roads that were blocked off and purposely omitted Route 111, hoping that the Spencers would take that road. He then stationed himself at the point where the legitimate detour began, with the result you have already witnessed. And so, another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation was closed. Closed with the arrest and subsequent conviction of all four of the wanted criminals. That is an important result, and one of which your FBI is justly proud. But it also is proud of the fact that the two special agents, by their alertness and speed, prevented the commission of another serious crime, and thus possibly prevented the death of any innocent people who might have tried to thwart the attempted holdup of the racetrack. It may appear to you that this case reduced the number of active American criminals by only a handful. But it is well to remember that each handful is important. For any reduction in their number is a help. A help toward the ultimate goal. The goal of total victory. Of total extinction. So that the time may come when the present army of American criminals is reduced to being only one thing. A very unpleasant memory. In just a moment, you will hear about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. But first, a few words from our Equitable Society representative on the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. I'm one of the 8,000 Equitable Society representatives all over America. We Equitable men sincerely believe in this fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. We know from experience that it's a time saver, a worry saver, and a family saver. So why delay? Ask your equitable representative for a free copy of the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard care of this radio station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case exposing one of the most vicious of all criminal activities. Its subject, extortion. Its title... Gentlemen prefer widows. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Tony Barrett, Ed Begley, Bill Hawes, Charlotte Lawrence, and Carlton Young. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Gentlemen, prefer widows on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.